Hi, hello, bonjour, and namaste. This is Out of the Clouds, a podcast at the crossroads between business and mindfulness. And I am your host, Anne Mulatala. So today I am delighted to introduce you uh, to Manfreda Cavazza, a collaborator of mine who I was introduced to over 18 months ago now by a very close friend of mine, Eton. Uh, Manfreda is a writer, a journalist, and a copy editor, my copy editor. And she edits my work on a weekly basis for the newsletter that I release for avm.consulting, which is uh, my main business. So it feels indulgent and wonderful to interview a journalist to reverse the tables on Manfreda. And so we talk about her childhood between Brazil, Italy, and England, what it's like to not fit in, how she sailed around the world for a year with her husband and two little girls. And then we talk about business. We talk about tone of voice, how to put ourselves in our audience's shoes and why it matters. So I give you my long-ranging and wonderful interview with Manfreda Cavazza. Enjoy. Manfreda, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Out of the Clouds. Thank you. It's very exciting to be here too. (laughs) Wonderful. I love to ask my guests to start by telling our listeners the story of who they are and what they do. Okay. Well, my name is Manfreda, obviously. Uh, And... Yeah, what's my story? So I grew up abroad. I lived in Brazil when I was little. And then in Italy, my my dad's Italian and my mum was English. And so, yeah, I think I've had a very colourful, very privileged, very different life. My parents were quite free spirited people. They, They were very adventurous and they liked to go against the grain, I guess. So they were given this opportunity when they were young to go and live in Brazil. And my dad was asked to go and work on a family farm. It belonged to my grandfather, but he wanted to send his son out to Brazil to set up this new life for the family. And my dad just took the chance to go and and went with his relatively new wife and and me as a three-month-old baby. And this was in the late 70s. And so it was just quite an exciting sort of adventurous way to to start their lives together so that's that's where I grew up and I've always I feel like that's been something that has really defined me as a person because I mean obviously now I live in the UK and I I've spent a lot of time living and working here in, in Britain went to university here I've lived in London for many years and I just feel like I've never really met many people who've had that sort of background in fact I've always felt like it's been to my detriment in a way because I feel like I missed out on um, a lot of culture and tv and like when my friends talk about the sort of tv programs that they watched when they were little and the music that they listened to and the sort of life that they had I just literally have no connection with that whatsoever but as I've grown older, I've realized that that sort of adventurous spirit and just going out there and, and living your life and not really conforming is something that I think has been instilled in me. Obviously, I've been a lucky person in that I have a very supportive family and, and have been able to do things because of the support that I have from my family. But I also think that I've never turned down exciting opportunities and adventure because of that sort of beginning that I had in my life I guess but yeah I don't know how far to go and how much to say with my story but that's sort of the beginning and I think it has shaped me as a person so after I was 10 when we left Brazil um and I was I was distraught about leaving in fact I remember finding an old diary of mine that I wrote in the sort of months before we left and I was just so emotional about it and I just loved it and I you know I had my friends I had my school I had all my activities that I used to do I had a very full and colorful childhood and I I just didn't want to go anywhere we ended up living outside Rome for a few years and 
I did love it there, but I felt like I, in fact, this has been sort of a pattern. I felt like I never really, I didn't really fit in there either. <laughs> and it was just a bit of an odd situation because we were living outside of Rome, but I was going to school in Rome and there, it was a long journey back and forth every day. And I, I felt like I was missing out on all the fun that my friends were having who lived in Rome. Um, and by this point I was coming up to sort of 13, 14 and my parents then decided me to send me to boarding school because they couldn't drive me back and forth to Rome every day. And for some reason that to them sending me abroad again was like the best solution. And I absolutely loved it there. I went to school in West Sussex uh, called St. Michael's near Petworth. And it wasn't a brilliant school, but I just really gained a huge amount of independence. I mean, with hindsight, it was a bit sad that I wasn't at home for the those teenage years but I just had such a lovely time it was very sort of Mallory Towers um you know all girls boarding school midnight feasts and all that sort of thing all very jolly and then I went back to Rome actually to do my A-levels because my school closed down it wasn't a great school as I said actually going to that school the, the second school I went to in Rome was brilliant it was an international school and they really pushed me and I think they they saw in me some potential that I don't think any other school had seen and they encouraged me to apply to Oxford so I did and I really didn't think I'd get in but I did and Oxford was amazing I had a, an amazing time there and I've, the friends that I made there are still people that I'm in touch with now and I studied I studied English and Italian literature and, and that was such a lovely course and then I went to London after that and yeah, so London was interesting for me because throughout university, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do in terms of my career. And I just, I tried to do the corporate thing. I did a graduate sort of three month um, internship at L'Oreal because that was just, it was a business that I think was targeting my university. And I knew I need, I wanted to do something that was creative and that used writing and words. And I just thought marketing would be a good place for me. But I, I didn't like being part of a big corporate organization and, and environment. I just felt too constrained, like I was a, a, a tiny cog in a big organization. And I just, I didn't enjoy it. So I ended up pursuing journalism as a career, but it was so difficult to get into, really highly competitive and I got hundreds of rejections and just really struggled to get anywhere, but eventually got a job working for a financial newswire. And that's actually where I met Etorn, which is why we were eventually connected. So it's funny how those things work. But yeah, I worked for this um, newswire just as a sub editor. So I was literally editing other people's work, but I was there for a whole year and it was the starting point for me to then pursue a career. And I ended up getting into business journalism because of that first job I, I fell into business journalism I thought I'd be end up doing something a bit more creative like travel or feature writing but business journalism was a really good place for me to to end up in so I went from working at AFX News to Retail Week and I was a reporter there for a couple of years and I covered the fashion sector which was really fun and I loved being a business journalist because I just found it was just really interesting talking to all these amazing people that had done so well and had grown their businesses and just really having that access to those sorts of minds, I guess. And, you know, my job was to go in and, and ask difficult questions and find out, you know, what their plans were, what their strategies were and just find good industry stories. And retail was a great sector to write about. It was, you know, the, the sort of early 90s and there was so much going on in retail. Amazing personalities, really cool brands. There's one thing that I want to go back to you for a second that I feel is really interesting. So what I heard you tell me in the story of your upbringing in Brazil and even after in in Rome and being an early teenager, not feeling like you found yourself fitting in necessarily mm. and being a nonconformist as your parents had been and not someone who'd say no to an adventure. Yeah. I am so not surprised that you <laughs> were not a fit for L'Oréal. <laughs> yeah. I want to share with you that I, even though I didn't move around that much, I did not fit in either. 
Mm. And I think that sometimes, well, first of all, I don't know how many people really think that they fit in. So I think yes. that there's a debatable point there. The question is, do they ever say it out loud? Yeah. And I think that those of us who really don't feel like they fit in are generally have a sort of an inner fire and a passion that propels mm. them to go out and find the place or the thing or the people yep. that that help them fit in. And I love the story of you discovering um, yourself in, in a way in, yeah. in that boarding school, which by the way, as a teenager, that would have been my nightmare. Yeah. Oh, your nightmare. Because, yes, because in Switzerland, it's not something, I mean, of course there are Swiss boarding schools that are famous, but generally they're famous for housing the children of incredibly rich people. And so for me, it doesn't make sense because we don't have the example of what that looks like. Mm. But I know that Eton, our common friend, she went to boarding school and she loved it. I know half of her friends from boarding really? school. That's so funny. It's yeah. the same in Italy, actually, because I remember my Italian family being really shocked that that my parents sent me to boarding school. They were like, what, what's she done wrong? And <laughs> my parents were like, no, 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 this is going to be good for her. She's not in trouble. She's not done anything wrong. She's not being packed off to some sort of correct correct you know correction institute or whatever it's just the <laughs> the culture and, and my mum was English so she knew what English boarding schools could do for for children I mean I I would never send my kids to boarding school but that's only from more of a selfish thing and, and also the cost nowadays is just ridiculous in terms of teaching children independence and giving them all the sort of the sport, the extracurricular activities, all you're, all you're doing is you're just hanging out with your friends and doing all of these things with your friends and having to look after yourself. So, you know, we had to, we had to learn how to keep our rooms tidy and do all our washing and make our beds and organize ourselves. I think it's a great, it can be great. (laughs) I think that from your mother's point of view is like, yay, she's going to learn all of that. And I don't have to nag her. I think that's a winner uh, from a, from that parenting perspective. (laughs) But so I'm so interested to hear about how your career really took a turn because of that first job. It's so interesting. And I don't know if I believe in coincidence Mm. or in synchronicity. But I really love what you were saying about the business minds and and retail. And you're back writing in retail nowadays. It seems to be something that uh, that's pursuing you in some way. Yeah. So it's funny. So after I left um, AFX News, uh, and actually there's a bit that I forgot to say, because it took me a long time to actually get into journalism. It was almost a sense of, I didn't have the self-belief that I could just do it. So I ended up doing a postgraduate course after my university degree. I I did the L'Oreal thing. I did go away for a bit. I went traveling. I did a ski season, which was really fun. And then I came back and I was like, right, if I'm going to make this work, and obviously the corporate world isn't for me, I want to be a journalist, but I don't have any credentials and I just need to go and do a course. So I did a postgraduate course in journalism. And I think that's what then gave me the confidence to apply to these sorts of journalism jobs. But what was interesting is the the Retail Week job, I must have applied for it rather than anyone trying to find me, but I just wasn't sure about it because it was a trade magazine and I just thought, oh, this is going to be really boring. But it really wasn't because of the because of the sector that I was covering. And maybe if I'd ended up in any other trade magazine, I would have fallen in love with that sector. I mean, there's lots of brilliant business trade magazines that that, uh, exist in the UK. But yeah, so retail was great because the the guy that that was my editor then is still the editor now. And so I get commissions still, you know, 20 years since I worked there, I'm still being asked to write articles for them. And I love it because it's still a really vibrant sector there's still so much going on so much change you know if you think about e-commerce and the rise of online shopping and how people are coping with that and the lockdown has had a massive impact and yeah the last article I wrote for them was about the four-day week and it was really interesting to look at how the retail sector might embrace that sort of working culture. I have a very soft spot for retail because I think that in in Europe in general and I find yeah, I want to make a generalization. So in Europe in general, I find that retail doesn't uh, necessarily hold a lot of respect when you work retail. No, it's yeah, like a lesser right. kind of job than if you worked 
journalism, medicine, or many other things. And, and yet everybody uses and benefits from the work that is done by retailers, right? Mm. And how much did we miss them when they were gone, when we couldn't go anywhere? And there's so much that gets to be experienced in stores and and so many connections. I love the people at my supermarket. I don't know what to say. (laughs) I think, I mean, there are some amazing European retail brands and obviously there's some amazing all sorts of you know global retail brands but I do think there is something about the British retail scene which it's so vibrant and so creative and I mean there was this quote that we always used to bring out which is that we're a nation of shopkeepers the Brits are a nation of shopkeepers and we just have this lovely shopping culture and I think that now because of the pandemic and because of online becoming having such an impact on physical stores people who work in retail are having to be even more creative and and even more thinking of all sorts of different ways to get people in and get get them shopping Mm. but the re-commerce space is something that is also super interesting because obviously with sustainability being such a major thing for for consumers there's some very interesting re-commerce brands popping up and seeing how that is going to pan out I think will be really key but if you don't mind, I just want to go back a step. Yeah. Because I wanted to know, were you ever interested in writing when you were younger? Did you know you wanted to get into writing? Yes. I think writing was always something that I loved doing as a child. I wasn't a consistent diary writer, but I had always had a diary on the go. I wouldn't write every day, but um, I would pour out all of my emotions into my diaries. English was always one of my favorite subjects at school. I I was an avid reader. So I was the eldest of three girls. And I think my mum spent a lot of time teaching me how to read. So I learned how to read when I was quite young. And also living in Brazil, you know, we actually lived in the city, but my dad was a farmer. And so we used to spend a lot of time on the farm and there wasn't a TV for ages. So there was literally nothing to do apart from (laughs) read or you know go out and about and go riding and chase cows and stuff which was fun but may I ask whereabouts in Brazil you were uh, so, okay so we lived in Sao Paulo we had a small apartment in the city and that's where we went to school but the farm was in this place called Barretos which was a five-hour drive from the city inland but if you imagine I don't know if you've ever been to Brazil but the landscapes are incredible so we would do this really really long drive and obviously this is before screens, before mm. any of that sort of stuff. I don't think I read in the car because I think that would have made me <laughs> sick. But yeah, I tried. I never managed. I just remember spending hours and hours staring out the window and imagining things and listening to music and having this constant sort of narrative going on in my head of, I don't know what, I think I imagined who, you know, who I was going to fall in love with and all the sort of... Ro- I was always a bit of a romantic, actually. Yeah, so reading was always a, a, a big thing for me. And even though I love writing, and I, I have written for, for my job for, for many years, and I do think I'm a good writer. I don't think I'm an amazing writer. You know, I don't think, I don't think I'm a novelist. I'm not that sort of writer. So even though I love writing and I love working with words and I love reading and I love language, I just, I actually think that it, it's something that I have learned to do through my work. And, it, you know, you get better and better at it, but it's a skill that is honed and that is developed and you need to have a joy for it. And you need to, obviously you need to enjoy doing it. And there needs to be some sort of innate ability to do it. But I, I wouldn't say that I, you know, as a child, I, I was planning on becoming a, a famous writer. It's something that I think eventually became my job because I worked hard at it. And mm. I realized that being in a corporate environment wasn't going to be right for me. And I wanted to do something that was more creative. So I just sort of made it happen, I guess, is what I'm mm. trying to say. It's interesting So on the one hand side, you were seeking a career that would have creative elements, not be too boxed in, Mm. but then you were interested in business and in business minds and in how things work. Yeah. And, and you were on the receiving end of interesting information and discovery. And then you kind of now pulled it all together as a business writer and as a strategist. 
yeah. because you get to do all of these things and I hope that you have access to to all of the kind of minds that you'd like to to be exploring in in your current role. So I think this is a very interesting transition because I read a piece on on your website. And it was called Story Listening, which yes. was a very good title, <laughs> very up my street. And actually it spoke to me on multiple levels because you described yourself as someone who was very curious and very fast, impatient, yes. you said that you were. I wanted to read this quote and for you to tell us a bit more about it. So you said, I wasn't the scariest of news reporters. If anything, I was a bit of an introvert, but I thrived on the pressure and the few years I spent doing that job taught me so much. And the most important lesson I learned as a reporter was to focus on the reader, my audience. Once I got that notion clear in my head, the work became easier. It wasn't about me. It was about the reader. My purpose was to serve them. Yeah. And I thought that was so fascinating because I, I felt like I was almost in the room with you when that, when that aha moment sort of <laughs> happened. Can you tell me what made that connection and, yeah. and tell us more about it? So I think, I mean, you know, we, a lot of women suffer from imposter syndrome. And when you're in that sort of job where there's hundreds of people wanting to do the same job that you're doing and you really have to be confident and you really have to have self-belief and at that point I was at the Daily Mail and it was obviously a daily paper I was working on the city desk incredibly talented people all around me and I just was I was constantly thinking that I wasn't good enough and it's such a high pressure job because every day you're there and you have the news meeting in the morning and everyone's pitching their stories. And, um, and that's what I meant when I said I wasn't the scariest of news reporters because I was quite quiet in the morning meetings and I was nervous and, you know, people around me who'd been there for longer would be quite forthcoming with the stories that they wanted in the paper because we're almost competing with each other so we were pitching the stories to our editor this brilliant man Alex Brummer he's still there I think actually he's a fantastic editor and I felt that I I just needed to gain more confidence and be better at pitching my stories and myself and my ideas but I got really stuck in this sort of negative inner voice that was going on in my head just constantly telling me that I wasn't cut out for this and I wasn't good enough and I think actually it was it ended up being a conversation I had with the news editor who just was like look you're these people that are reading these articles you've got access to amazing information you've got the Daily Mail obviously being with such a high circulation everyone wanted to talk to us every single chief executive of any retail company wanted to talk to me because my my beat was retail because I obviously had covered retail at retail week so they hired me as a retail reporter and and I think that's when the sort of the aha moment happened and it was like I have a job to do here which is to help all these retail investors figure out whether or not to buy shares in M&S or Tesco or Sainsbury's and I can ask the CEOs of these people of these companies you know, what are they doing? How are they going to expand? And why should people invest in them? So that's when it, my sort of insecurities was, were taken out of the equation. That's when I realized that I didn't have to be the, the scary reporter. I didn't have to be full of, you know, bravado. It was just, I was just doing a job for someone else. And I don't know why that made it feel easier or better, but it really did. Um, I know why. <laughs> I know why. And it's you really can tell funny. me, Anne, then. What, what yes, I it? can. Because I have a post-it that talks about right. that on my desk. <laughs> I think that imposter syndrome or any other manifestations of fear that get us stuck, man, woman, non-identified, mm -hmm. one of the ways that we can get ourselves unstuck is to actually try to consider what we would do or how we would act if we came at it from a sense of purpose mm. or a sense of service. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's so interesting because sometimes in conversation, in coaching, or or when I feel like I'm at my desk and I'm procrastinating and I'm not doing as well as I'd like to be doing with my time, I try to 
I, it doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> I try to look at the post-it and go, okay, think about it in terms of the people that you want to serve, mm. whether it's an audience, whether it's a client, like show up for them. And then suddenly yeah. things are much easier. Yeah. I think I, I literally imagined these people going, you know, reading the Daily Mail and because, you know, I love working for the Daily Mail. It's not my favorite newspaper, I have to say. There was a lot about that newspaper that I didn't agree with. But the fact that I worked for the city section made it better in a way because it, it was a smallish section at the back, but it was so well read. You know, millions of people read it. And so I was sort of like, these people are reading me, reading my articles about Tesco or Sainsbury's or M&S. And they want to know, you know, I just imagine what would they ask if they were sitting in the room and they had to invest their shares in something and they were picking retail as a sector because they believed in it. Mm. What would they want to know? And that's when, so it's just taking me out of the equation. I think that I was just like, okay, what, would, what do they need to know? What are the issues that this business is facing? What are the mistakes that potentially the CEO has made? And, you know, it was that. And then, and then you become, it's like being an investigative reporter, I guess. You're, you have a job to uncover. Because often these big corporate companies, they try to make things sound better than they are. So my mm-hmm. job was then to just figure it out and go, okay, you said you're doing this, but what does that actually mean? You said you're going to expand in China. Why are you going there? Is that a waste of time? You know, and then you start getting into it and you start understanding the trends and you start comparing businesses to other businesses. And also the, the job entailed talking to lots of, not just the companies, but also to a lot of analysts. If I ever felt really, truly stuck, it would be, you'd pick up the phone to an analyst and go, I don't understand this. Why is this business doing this when it doesn't make sense in the situation? And and the analysts obviously have incredible minds and, and they would be brilliant at dissecting numbers that were really complicated. So yeah, I loved it. I loved working for the Daily Mail. It was such a brilliant job and it was really sad when that sort of came to an end, but it was to do with kids and family life and just the two didn't mix. I worked there full time as a staff reporter for about two and a half years and then mm-hmm. I did I went back and I did shift work after having children. They would get me in to do to do cover when people were away. And I actually really enjoyed that almost even more because my priorities had changed. And, you know, my family came first. But because it was a daily newspaper, it was the best job to have as a freelancer because all you did was you turned up in the day and you were sent. And often it wasn't retail. It was other sectors. You were sent off to cover the story of the day come back, write it up, and then you'd go home. And then the next day, the whole process would start again. So there was no hangover from the day before. It was just literally, okay, here's another day. Here's another story. Let's start the process again. So it was very straightforward in a way. Yeah, it's uh, bringing up the image of a whiteboard that just gets cleared every day. You just start again. Yeah, that's interesting. So hold on a second, because I know that you went and traveled and sailed around the world for a year. When did that happen? Okay, so that happened. So we we lived in London until, I think it was 15 years in the end. But by this point, I was married. We had two kids, my two eldest daughters. They were four and a half and three. And so Tim and I, my husband and I, Right at the beginning of our relationship, I think even before we got married, I remember him asking me what I wanted to do, what I wanted out of life. And one of my big dreams, and it just so happened that it was also his big dream because he's always been a a sailor. But one of my big dreams was to go traveling by boat. And I was like, I just want to go away and sail around the world. And and he and he said, well, I want to do that too. And so I, I don't know if that's why we ended up staying together, but it was definitely a, a thing that brought us together. And it was a dream and a vision that we had. I don't think we genuinely thought we would ever pull it off, but we, we talked and talked and talked about it. And all of our friends got so bored hearing us talk about it um, because I just don't think anyone believed that we would actually 
do it. But that's one of the great things about Tim is that he, when he has an idea and a plan, he's very, he's very different to me. He's very methodical. He works in IT. He's very good at technology. When he was young, he worked as a mechanic. So he's the kind of guy that would, will take things apart and put them back together again. And I think he was just, this idea was churning around in his head for years and years. And he was constantly looking at boats that were coming up on the market. And anyway, we did it. We basically figured out a way of saving up enough money to do it. We rented out our, our house in London. We bought this old 1980s yacht that needed a lot of work. And Tim spent about a year, I think, in the end, preparing this boat for our big trip. And there was a bit of a deadline for us because I, even though I like thinking of myself as being a free spirit, I didn't feel like I could be a total gypsy. So I wanted to be back in time for the kids to start school. And so, but they were three and four. My eldest actually missed the first year of school. So we, we homeschooled her on the boat, but it was just, the, it was just reception. So she missed reception, but we had this deadline. I wanted to be back for them to go to school not just for academic reasons, but mainly for friendships and social life. And I just didn't think it was right to drag them along on this trip for too long. So it was it was always going to be a year and we needed to get it done and be back in time for them to start school. So I think that's what eventually was the crunch time was we were like, if we're going to do it, we have to do it now. And so, yeah, we went off to Greece and that's where we started. I wrote about it. I wrote a blog loved writing that blog and and uh, I think everyone was super surprised that we actually left and they couldn't <laughs> believe it but they we had a lot of people following us on our journey and we put loads of pictures out I decided right from the beginning that I, it wasn't going to be a travel blog it wasn't going to be a we're sailing mm. this, from this place to the other it was going to be about what it was like to bring up kids and and the the nitty-gritty of life on a boat I mean it's still up there you can you can see it and so there's lots of harrowing stories about potty training on a boat, homeschooling, storms that we were stuck in, seasickness. For a long time, actually, even though it sounds like it was super idyllic, we we were a bit lonely. We thought we would meet loads of people doing similar crazy trips, but it took us a long time. And I think it's because at the beginning of the trip, we were sailing around the Mediterranean and there isn't like a route. It's not like people go one way around the Med. So we never really hooked up with anyone. So we made some lovely friends, the Duncans, and they we met them in the Balearics, I think it was, in Ibiza. And th- at that point, I was uh-huh. desperate to make friends. Mm-hmm. And I actually went on a forum, a sailing forum, and I, I just said, we're a family, we've got two girls, we're, we're going to the Caribbean, this is the route we're going, is anyone else out there? <laughs> And this person responded and it was uh, Lisa and Gil and we arranged to meet and it was just the funniest thing. It was like, I think I sort of pounced on Lisa. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I've got another mum friend who's got a husband who's dragged her out on this crazy journey. And I just remember we were in Mahan in Menorca and we just got really drunk and we just got on like a house on fire, basically. And, and we're almost inseparable for for the rest of the trip. We sailed everywhere together. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. I want to know what your favorite spot was. Oh, well, actually that Mahon, I loved Mahon. Okay. We had so much fun in that place. It's a lovely town. I don't know if you've mm. been there. Not yet. No. Bay, um, where we were anchored. So we stayed there for quite a while. There's for, uh, Formentera opposite. Absolutely. Yeah near there anyway that was a beautiful island loved that loved the Mediterranean even though we didn't make any friends Greece was just the the water in Greece is just amazing and the food and everyone in Greece really looked after us just the kindness of of the people in Greece was was amazing they were all slightly shocked that we were traveling around with these tiny little girls (laughs) in their little dresses oh what's my favorite spot that's a really tricky question. I didn't actually sail across the Atlantic. I, I felt like that was a bit much for me to do with, with the children. So I actually came off the boat for a few weeks and my husband sailed across the Atlantic with some of his friends and also his his mum, who the minute we told her that we were going to go sailing, she said, I'm going to do the Atlantic. She's a 
big sailor and super brave and amazing. And she just was like, I, I'm having a place on that boat when you sail across the Atlantic. So I had to get off the boat to make way for my mother-in-law. <laughs> But yeah, so she did the Atlantic with my husband and and some other friends. And so then I met them in the Caribbean with the girls. We flew out and we met them in St. Lucia and we sailed around the the Caribbean for six months. And there was a beach in Barbuda, an island off Antigua, which sadly, I think Barbuda was really badly hit by one of the hurricanes a few years ago. I think it was evacuated and a lot of the buildings were destroyed in that hurricane. But it's coming back now and I think there's a lot of investment to try and get that island back up and running. But there's this beautiful beach that is, the sand is like a pale pink because it's it's sort of coral sand and there's hardly anyone there. And I'd say that was my favourite spot. It's That's called Princess amazing. Diana Beach. Oh, okay. Barbuda, yeah. I'll really check it out. Very special place. <laughs> so what was it like to come back to work after a year out? What did you come back to? Yeah, so that it was hard. It was really difficult to to get back into normal life. Probably harder for my husband, actually, than it was for me because I had two young girls and I enjoyed that that time because it was about getting them settled into school house hunting which is always fun uh, and just kind of setting ourselves up down here in the countryside near the sea which has always been a draw it took us a few years I'd say to get fully settled but Tim misses it terribly he'd love to be back on a boat and sailing around the world again and I think eventually we will do it again one day but it'll be when when the kids have left it's so funny so I'd like to come now, I, I really want to talk about the kind of work that you do for brands. Mm. I really enjoyed discovering your uh, website and obviously we work together, but it was interesting for me to also read about how you talk to people about what you do, because I think a writer is essentially also a communicator, right? And you were expressing that your tool is evocative storytelling techniques yes, and an editorial approach to help your clients find their voice. Yes. And I wanted you to tell us more about that, how it works and why it matters. Okay. So I use the word evocative because one of the issues I have with a lot of marketing writing that I see is that I feel that there is this disconnect between what the business is trying to be and and say about itself and what the customer actually wants to hear and I think a lot of the time um, and this is not me saying it it's a lot of people have written books about it it's it's about making sure that you get people to feel something through your writing so it's not just we are a great product you have to buy us because it's how can we make you feel better how are we going to make your life better how are we going to save you time how are we going to give you an amazing experience. You know, people are selfish. Fundamentally, people just want to make themselves feel good and feel better. And a, a brand, in my opinion, needs to tap into that feeling and emotion and how to get people engaged with your product in a sort of emotional way. I think sometimes businesses are so busy trying to build their business and trying to create a product but then the bit that they don't do so well sometimes is the the explaining who they are and why people should buy into them and and what it is that about them that makes them different and makes them special. There's lots of people that do what I do and there's lots of books that have been written about this. But it's just it's something that I have noticed it gets forgotten. It's just it kind of slips down the list. Mm. And you know, there's all these targets, there's all this, you know, like if you think you you and I both worked in PR, it's all about numbers and how many people have read this piece and how many people am I am I gonna reach? But you have to actually just go the other way. And a bit like the the lesson that I learned when I was a reporter, you've got to put yourself in their shoes and um in your customers' shoes and just really think about what's in it for them. Why should they care? Why should they buy this product? You know, what's what? How are you going to help them? So that's a sort of evocative 
part and then the editorial approach it's very connected to that idea it's like when I was sitting in news meetings at the Daily Mail they didn't look at press releases and and go oh let's write about this and here's the headline and that's what we want to write they never did you know no editorial team would ever look at it from the point of view of the company they're looking at it from very much a storytelling point of view and they're also thinking about their audiences it has to be in the public interest. It has to be timely. It has to be something that's potentially never been done before. There has to be a first, you know, it's the first time that this has happened or it's the biggest profit that, you know, a company has announced or it's the first time they've gone to a, uh, an international market. You know, there has to be a story behind it. And again, I think companies often get very stuck in looking in on themselves and they forget that there's hundreds of other companies making similar announcements or selling similar products. And it's just using that editorial sort of discerning way of looking at a story or an idea or a launch and going, how are we going to make this interesting to customers or to readers or to your audience? It's just being a bit clever about it, I guess. Mm. Yeah. To your point, I think that you're you're raising something that's really important. I think most companies, as the people you described, can be a little bit self-centered, mm. think that the world revolves around them or mm. will. And it's true, I often find that most of the people that I've worked with forget this sense of urgency and newsiness. And I've tried to explain it to most of my clients to say, if it's not newsy, people are not going to write about it. And it doesn't mean that your product is not wonderful, but you still need to find, in French you say, une accroche, it's like a hook, right? Something something that people can go, oh, I can talk to my readers about it because it's February and blah, blah, blah. One of the things that I really enjoyed on the, the PR side is the opportunity to be creative and to do something fresh with something that's not new and look at things from a different angle. And I think that's also what an editorial approach can do for a business. Yes, totally. Uh, Right? It's like recurating a collection around a theme. You can re-merchandise a a whole store um, and suddenly it feels like it's a brand new collection or a brand new year. And yeah, it's the same product that was here last week. Yeah. Completely. And I think that's where storytelling comes into it because, you know, there's always something that hasn't been told or there's a behind the scenes element. There's a, did you know this is how this is made? Or here's a really interesting interview with someone who you've never heard of before, but who has been massively involved with making of, I don't know, whatever the product is. I think there's always a way around it. It's just about having that sort of editorial hat on where you go. We're not just trying to push a product or um, an idea for for no reason. You have to give people something and and be generous with ideas. And I know you hate the word content. I hate it too. I literally want to invent a new word. (laughs) I've got such an issue with that word. It's funny that you've mentioned the word box because I always, when it first started being used, I literally was like, the contents of a box does not sound exciting to me. So that's why I try to use the word storytelling more. And when I talk about content strategy, you can be super creative and come up with lots of really lovely ideas, but you still need to have a bit of a plan. And what I like to do for my clients is I will literally map it out and I'll go from month to month. I will say, you know, you can talk about this then and let's put this interview then. If you're doing an interview on your website or you're writing a blog on your website, then you could have three or four social media stories that tie into that. If you're doing PR, you know, it's all connected. And so that's why I call that a content strategy plan but I would love to reinvent the word content we need to between you and I we just need to come up with a a new version (laughs) I agree I'll start working on that yeah now I also saw you I think that was actually on your Instagram and you wrote recently that great writing isn't born but that writing should be renamed as editing yeah could you please tell us more about that well um 
I love editing. And obviously, you and I have worked together for a year now with me editing your work. And I love, I literally love editing your work because I think you, every week you could always come up with something really super interesting to say. And so I just think with writing, and I'm sure you have written many drafts by the time I see it. So I'm actually not having to do a huge amount of work when I edit your writing. But I just think often when you put things down on paper, it can be, if you want it to be perfect from day one or from the the first edition, you're never going to get it down. So my view is you just need to get it down on paper, knowing that you will jiggle things around, you will delete, you will move things up and down. But it's just that process of getting it down on paper that really starts the creative flow of getting your ideas out. She might be Anne Handley. Do you follow her? Yeah, I think it was her. She said, it takes at least four drafts before it's any way decent. I agree with her a hundred percent. I didn't know that when I was younger. I always thought to myself, I couldn't write in English and I made the choice to start writing in English. I just got stuck mm. for years. I got stuck because I couldn't imagine how to get started. And, and well, I hadn't studied it and no one had told me about shitty first drafts. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anne Lamott also talks about shitty first drafts and I love her. now. I want to talk about this because I think it's it's particular to the work that you and I have done and some other people do as well. But I want to put it out there for, for anyone who doesn't work in branding and who wants to be working a little bit um, more in depth on the work they put out in the world. Can you talk to us about the importance of tone of voice mm. when someone writes for their brand? Right. So tone of voice is something that I don't know whether you can go to school and learn how to do tone of voice, but I approach it very much from a sort of intuitive perspective. And I approach it because of my background in writing and, you know, the knowledge of words and editing and and keeping things concise and coming up with phrases and sentences to help businesses create this sense of uniformity. And for me, that's what tone of voice is all about. And I've always compared it to when you have a logo designed or you have branding designed for your business, you know, there are very strict rules about colors, where the logo goes, what it goes with, the size, etc. And and a huge amount of time and effort goes into the look and feel of a brand or a product. And I just really strongly believe that the same attention needs to be spent on the way you talk about a brand. So that's what tone of voice is about. It's it's creating this voice this sense of who you are in a way that is repeated again and again and again and I think it's that repetition that makes people understand who you are and what you stand for and also they get to know you as a brand because you are saying the same things in the same way again and again so it's not just the words that you use necessarily, but it's how you use them. So there are loads of great examples of of tone of voice out there. You know, Innocent is the one that gets quoted a lot. They were one of the first to really come up with a quite a cheeky tone of voice and, and the way they do their writing on their packaging is very them. There was a really interesting interview with the marketing director of Tony's Chocoloni. I don't know if you know that brand, it's a UK chocolate brand that has been quite really come up in, in terms of popularity in the last couple of years. You literally see them everywhere. But I think their tone of voice is excellent. And they I think their test is if you couldn't see any colours or any logos, could you still tell that this is a Tony Chocoloni product just by the words. So that's what they're trying to achieve. They're really trying to create a stamp, if you like, a brand through the words and the the, the, the tone that they use in their marketing copy. And it's great. It can be quite subtle. You don't have to be all shouty in, in the way you talk about your brand. And the example that is used a lot and that I use a lot with some clients is the, the UK government website. I don't know if you ever need to access it, but the way they write and the tone on the UK government website is just brilliant. And someone has spent a lot of time and money getting that right. It's really simple, really clear. The layout is good. And for them, you know, they obviously thought about their audience very much when they came up with their tone of voice, because they know that people are 
needing to find information quickly. Mm. They're stressed. They're probably doing their tax return. And mm-hmm. it's just, how do we get this across in the simplest and clearest way possible? It's interesting what you mentioned here, because it's bringing me this image that tone of voice is it's almost that in-between space where brand meets audience needs. Mm. It's almost like that, that juncture point because yeah. brand has a lot of desires and things they want to express and audience and clients have got all of their thing going on. Yeah. And tone of voice can be that bridge in between Yeah, that helps the right brand find the right client. Totally. And I often get approached to do copywriting projects for websites, for example, or I'm writing blogs for people. And I will always say, do you have a tone of voice document? Because if you don't, I am going to struggle because I need to understand what you're about. And the tone of voice is very tied into purpose and vision and the brand's mission and how, what they're trying to achieve and how they're going to achieve it. Because what you almost need to start with that then you come up with a tone of voice and then you can start writing copy and blogs Mm -hmm. and social media captions. But there is a bit of a process. You have to understand who you are, who you're talking to, what you're trying to say to them and what obviously they want to hear. And then Mm -hmm. that all gets put together in, in a sort of strategy tone of voice document, which is what I end up doing for a lot of my clients. Well, the one thing I want to say for anybody who hasn't done this, who feels like they should be doing it and that once it's done, it's over, I'm going to break the news that it's not. Because the the problem I find in my work is for my own projects is that I forget the tone of voice document that I made. Yeah. And sometimes the tone I'm using on certain copy is actually not that consistent necessarily with my intention because like anything else we forget and I feel like it's a labor of love where it's good to have these conversations (laughs) because it feels like it feels to me right now like you're telling me that I need to work on it even though that's not (laughs) obviously (laughs) what's going on so I think I was asking this question for myself (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad to have been of service (laughs) no but that is something that I it is a problem I think sometimes we create these wonderful tone of voice documents for our clients and they just sit somewhere and they get forgotten. Mm. Um, And I think it's a real uh, testament to businesses like the Tony Toccoloni example that I gave you, but there's countless of others that it's fully ingrained in their business. And actually MailChimp is, Ah, if you look at the MailChimp tone of voice document that's on their website, they're very good at making that apparent across their whole business. And I don't know whether every member of staff gets given it and it's like in front of them as they're working but it, it, there are some businesses that really manage to get that tone debate or argument really ingrained everyone buys into it um but I think that's, it's obsession as a freelancer I think that's quite difficult to achieve you know you, I'm not part of their their business and I'm doing something for them and I'm handing it over then I don't know what happens afterwards I don't know whether everyone buys into it or not and I, but I think that's something that I might need to work on I think I need to you know I think you need to find an advocate within the company that mm-hmm. is going to carry the work I remember a couple of years ago I was I was hoping to bring on a sustainability expert to consult for one of my luxury clients and I will always remember she said to me listen at the end of the day it doesn't matter what I do because if there's not at least one person within the brand yeah that's going to be passionate and bang on about this and make everybody care, mm-hmm. then it's, it's not going to be any use. I think that's what missing for, for a lot of these things, what you're describing about the businesses that have done a, a great job is that they decided that they were obsessed about this mode of communication. Mm-hmm. And I think as you and I both know and everybody else that we've let photography images carry a lot of our storytelling for a long time. Mm. And in my experience, even when I was at Christian Louboutin, especially I feel when I was at Christian Louboutin, no one cared. Like what no one were. cared about the words. No. no one. I was mildly obsessed with it. Yeah. <laughs> with them, excuse me. There was such um, a rush to produce images, mm. to communicate through the media that is Instagram. That even though the Instagram captions were always thought through, they were always secondary to mm. the story that the images were 
we're bringing up. And actually, I like to argue with my clients that their storytelling should start in writing and that their, yeah. their images should match what they want to talk about. Absolutely. But that's, that's not for everybody. Um, now, you've recently contributed to a brand called Fat Phase mm. for a really gorgeous campaign that was called Made for Life. Yes. And I really, really enjoyed reading through the, the captions that, that you'd put on your website. Do you mind telling me about the project and how it resonated with the, the brand's audience? So this was for the first ever US catalogue that they launched last year. They've got a few stores in America now. Uh, obviously, it's a British outdoor sort of fashion high street brand that's, that's been quite successful in the UK and they've expanded to the US. But in the US, the catalogue market is really huge and they really wanted to, to communicate everything that they're about in the catalogue in order to drive, obviously, people to their online shopping uh, website, but also to the stores. So the, the purpose of the catalogue was to explain and bring the stories of Fat Face to life. And, and what they really wanted, which is why they hired me, I ended up working with another copywriter because the deadlines were really tight. But in America, the catalogues are very product led. And it's mainly picture of product and then sizes and prices. But they, what was lovely about this project is they really wanted to bring the sort of editorial style that is much more common in the UK and and translate it for the for the US market and it was just a really lovely project I mean we got quite a lot of um great briefing notes from the brand so they're very clear about who they are what they stand for and the made for life concept came from them that our job was to turn that into copy and the challenge was that it, the the word count was tiny like we had like 20, 30 words to play with on each page. The longer pieces were, I think, 100 words. And again, going back to that evocative storytelling, we had to get across the feeling and the ideas of being outside, of going on adventures, of exploring new places. Writing for catalogues is a, is a weird writing role because you are selling product, but you're trying to do it in a way that is interesting rather than it just being here's a t-shirt. So yeah, it took us a, a long time to get it right, but I think we did a good job. And what was really great is they've said, I don't know the numbers, I need to get the numbers from them, but it's definitely it led to a, a massive increase in sales. Like it, it resonated really well with, with the US market. So it worked. Mm. <laughs> interesting. I was the other week, I read this really interesting study, which I found staggering that 61% of the people polled, and I'll put this source in, in the show notes because I don't remember it by heart, but 61% of people polled trusted brands over governments and NGOs. And well, what I find really interesting about this is one of the ways that we build trust is with our actions, but it's also sometimes through our words and the values that we communicate. Is there any advice that you can give to any brand that wants to build this kind of sense of loyalty with their customer base? Yeah, so Fat Face is an interesting example. Over the years, they've really tried to um, be very clear about who they are and what they stand for. And sustainability is a big thing for them. They're investing a lot of time and energy into finding sustainable fabrics, using recycled fabrics where they can, organic cotton. And they really wanted to talk about that. And I think that the the values that are linked with being more sustainable because obviously fashion is is such an unsustainable industry and as consumers we're all trying to find ways to be more sustainable so if there is a fashion brand that is open and very transparent about how they are being more sustainable then that's really going to resonate and i mean governments and ngos not being trusted is 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 because of the way they behave and you know it, i can see why consumers will find it difficult to trust those sorts of organizations because i think over the years we've become much better at finding out what we need to know it's much easier to get access to information and you can really challenge organizations and brands when they make a claim so you've got to be very careful that what you say stacks up And you can prove that you are telling your consumers and your customers the truth. And I just think governments have become quite good at covering uh, up mis 
perhaps. And it's all about transparency, I guess. And perhaps also a lack of consistency. Because I think what you were describing before about the tone of voice and that mode of communication is when there's inconsistencies coming up continuously, it's hard for people to find trust. So I think I had one more one more question before I get us started on, on the quick fire round questions that I like to ask all of my guests. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, can you offer any advice to anyone who's building up a writing practice, either as a brand or for themselves, to their business as, as a freelancer? Okay. I think, oh, that's a tricky one. It's, it's quite difficult being a freelancer because you are on your own. So confidence is a huge thing. But I would say to anyone who's considering doing any sort of freelance work, not just writing, to have the confidence and to really go for it. Because I think, especially if you've worked in those sorts of industries before and you have experience, you can bring so much value to businesses. And I do think that a lot of companies are going to be investing a lot more in freelance and and consultancy type work because of just the nature of what's been going on in the last couple of years. And there is a lot more open-mindedness about investing in outside people. And there are so many platforms now to promote the work that you do and and your thoughts and beliefs and, you know, whether you're active on social or whether you launch a, a newsletter. So I think it's about being quietly confident, just making the first step to go and getting yourself out there networking and getting that first client but in, but also i would say in terms of actual the actual writing side of things and if there are any uh, freelance writers out there who want to do more writing there is so much demand for it at the moment i've got quite a few friends who are copywriters or freelance writers like i am and uh, everybody is busy i don't know anyone who doesn't have work So I guess that's a nice thing to hear, you know, if people are thinking about it, is that there is just so much demand for good copy. And I think it all boils down to this um, awareness. There is a growing awareness about communicating your values, being very clear about what your purpose as a business is, because that's what customers want to hear and, and they want to learn from the brands that they buy from. So in order to get that message across, like we were saying earlier, it's not just about pretty pictures. There is a huge amount of time and um, investment that goes into explaining what you're about. And that all, I genuinely believe it all boils down to to having good writers on your team who are able to to put together those thoughts and ideas in, in, in a good way, in a compelling way. Yeah. And I think on the branding side, on the branding side, what I would like to see brands do is to actually have writers in the same meeting as they would, you know, a creative director, as they would with whoever does photography and content development, because I find that everyone is too siloed. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, for the copy to have a better place at the table, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, there are lots of different types of writers, and that's something that I'd like to spend a bit more time talking about on my channels and, and in my new newsletter that I've just recently launched, because I think there isn't a huge amount of understanding about what writers do. So, you know, you have the, the sorts of writers that are great at writing product copy. You have writers that are great at creating advertising copy and slogans. You have long form writers who are better at pulling together slightly more complicated arguments in sort of blogs and longer form content. So I think there needs to be also from the writer's perspective, they need to communicate what it is that they do and all the different types of writing that is available because there you know there's so many different ways that you can be creative with words Mm, thanks so much I think that is a piece that most people don't consider Mm -hmm. and I know for example that great product copy is something that I notice as a consumer absolutely and and it generally touches me and it makes me feel better about whoever's website I'm on yeah Makes me feel like they care. Absolutely. 
And there's lots of really fun places that you can um, be creative with copy. I'm sure you've you've come across micro copy. So there's the actual copy that you get in, for example, in labels on clothing. Patagonia is really good at at micro copy. Oh, they're so great at it. I love that brand. Honestly, there's just so much I love about that that company. Its ethos it, as a whole is really well communicated. So yeah, there's lots of different types of copy writing. Mm. Uh, out there and I think if there are any people listening to this podcast who who are considering doing writing launching a writing business I think there are so many there's just so many different ways that you can stand out and be different to other writers you know just because I mean just don't don't think oh there's plenty of copywriters out there there isn't space for me but there is there's always demand for, mm. for good writers absolutely you know who came to mind as someone who's got great tone of voice and great product copy? It's Brown's, Brown's Fashion. Yeah, they're fab. Oh, they're so good. And they're lighthearted without being annoying. Yes. And that's a really interesting thing, which we haven't spoken about much, is humor. Mm. I think a lot of people, a lot of companies forget to, it's not about being hilariously funny, but I think a subtle humor running through your copy, I think is really important because you know, we've had such a shit time the last couple of years that any <laughs> opportunity to have a bit of a laugh is always welcome. I think <laughs> I think it's a good point to note. Is there anything that you'd like to add before we finish with our closing questions? No, I don't think so. I think you've been very exacting with your <laughs> questions. <laughs> it's right, really then. funny being on the other side. It's normally me asking the questions, but it's been really enjoyable. Oh, good. So I would love to know what is your favorite word and one that you would potentially tattoo on yourself. Okay. So I loved this question and it really got me thinking. I've got lots of, lots of words that I love. Um, and the word mellifluous is a word that I've loved for many years. I love the way it sounds. Again, it's a very evocative word. It, it sort of conjures up the idea of musical but also liquid and it's just it's just a lovely word but I've decided not that I would ever have anything tattooed on me (laughs) but I do love the word flow I think there is so much about the concept of flow and just the word in itself because it's a nice short word but I'm very drawn to so when you're massively in the zone when you're writing that to me is an example of flow. I've been doing yoga for many years, but it's become a massive part of my life and I have to do it every week, if not daily, in order to stay sane. And obviously flow is a massive part of yoga, but I love being on the water. I love swimming. I love being in the mountains and that whole idea of being in the zone and being totally focused on something beautiful and all-encompassing is what the word means to me. So that's my word, flow. Wonderful transition, because I'm about to ask you as well. You obviously know that the podcast is at the crossroads between business and mindfulness. So can you tell me perhaps about some of the rituals and the things that help keep you grounded, and particularly in difficult times? It's a good question. And obviously it's something that we've all had to learn to do in recent times. I've got three kids and it's obviously better now. Everyone's back at school and we're sort of returning to normality. But the last few years have been really tough on the family. Having everyone at home all the time and just everyone being cut off from their friends. My my eldest two are 14 and 12. So for that age group, I think being in lockdown was really hard. And I have found for me, it's the way I stay sane has, is very much, I need to move. I need to get outside. I need to run or swim. I've started cold water swimming. I know that's such a cliche, but I've been doing it with a friend of mine. We live really close to the sea and obviously it became a thing. And it's something that I wanted to get into for a long time. And then it was everywhere. And my friend and I just thought, let's do this. This is the time to to start. So we started in October, 2020. And we've been going every week, pretty much ever since, all year round. And it's the most incredible feeling when you when you get in the sea, when in the depths of winter, and it's just your whole body 
completely and utterly succumbs to the cold and your brain just switches off. And it's it's literally like a reset button. It's been very well documented, the effects, the, the benefit to mental health, but I can guarantee it's just been the most amazing thing. I'd like to, at the moment, it's more immersion. So we literally just go in for five minutes and scream and then come out again. <laughs> but I'd like to, I'd like to invest in a swimming wetsuit and actually swim because I love swimming. I swam a lot as a kid. And that again, connects to the whole idea of flow I just love being in the water so yeah so for me it's it's been about movement I literally have to move every day that's the way I stay sane like a lot of us <laughs> thank you so much for sharing what is a secret superpower that you have oh I, you know what I don't think I have a superpower do we have to have one? <laughs> oh, okay I'm, I'm shaking my head saying yes for you guys who can't see me I don't know what it is, but I do have a very uh, strange knack. I am able to literally conjure up meals out of nothing. So my husband will open up the fridge and just go, there's no food. I'll be like, yes, there is. And I'll make, normally it's some sort of pasta dish. But yeah, I think probably my random cooking is, it it might be a superpower. I think it's a superpower, but my family probably wouldn't agree. (laughs) I think it's creativity. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Because I agree. I sometimes come up with the best recipes when there's almost nothing left. Yeah. And last, oh, and I made an amazing pasta the other day. Yes. What was in it? It was a base a little bit by, like cacio e pepe. Oh, yummy. But I only oh, yeah. had parmesan and I had yeah. chili, garlic and fresh thyme. Oh, that's yummy. I'm going to have to make that tonight. We actually do have no food in the fridge at the moment. So I'm literally thinking, <laughs> what am I going to cook for dinner tonight? Ta-da! Now you have an inspiration. Yeah. A favorite book of yours? This wasn't difficult. I think I've spoken to you about this book before. It's Any Human Heart by William Boyd. And it's the most beautiful story about this man. He lives through various decades in different countries. And it's all about his different sorts of love affairs that he has with his different relationships. And I don't really... I haven't read it. I read it about six months ago and I totally fell in love with the story again. But it's more about him as a character you just totally feel this person and you feel his heart and you feel his emotions and the the best thing about it and I think this was a passage I sent to you it was the idea of having many different selves and I think that's something that is so true you know we're constantly trying to figure out who we are and what our personality is and how how to put our best selves forward but I think the point of what I loved what I took from this book is that you don't have to be any one thing like you have lots of different stages of your life and it's almost like these different layers of different characters that become you it's a a really wonderful book Mm, I'm gonna have to buy it (laughs) yes what is your favorite sound favorite sound okay This is really cheesy, but it's my kids laughing. I just, there's nothing better than the sound of my children giggling away. doesn't happen very often. I've got three girls and they argue a lot, but sometimes, or or when they're with friends, you know, and they're just in the, in the zone, having a nice time. It's just the best sound. Giggling. Sounds cute. (laughs) What is the last lie? that you told oh yes you did ask me that gosh I don't know stumped me actually it was probably um <laughs> probably my weight when I was hiring skis and oh, my Christmas holiday the same thing. there you go <laughs> which is really dumb because that doesn't help the no. ski. and actually it's funny because when I said the fake weight I suddenly stopped and went no 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 because I'm like no <laughs> Oh, the shame. Yeah. Where is somewhere that you've visited that felt like it really had an impact on who you are today? Okay. So after university and before I started working, I, I, I did a ski season. I spent six months working in the mountains. And it was that totally kind of the freedom of living that lifestyle but I didn't know anyone I just got this job didn't go with any friends or anything and I absolutely loved being in the mountains for that long and just you know 
cooking, skiing, just being there outside most days. It was just, it was a really lovely lifestyle. And I think that's, I didn't ever think of, I always thought I was a city girl, but that time that I spent in the mountains made me realize that actually I need, I love being in a city and I love the culture and I love, I loved my time in London, but I actually, I, I'm a much happier person since I moved out. So I think that has shaped me as a person. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. What is one of the most embarrassing moments that you can recall that you would like to share with us? Okay, so the first thing I saw that uh, your question and the first thing that sprung to mind was years ago when I was at the boarding school that I told you about. It was an all girls boarding school and there's a boys school nearby and that somebody in the boys school organized a fashion show. He actually ended up working in the fashion industry, very creative guy a few years above me, but he wanted to create this fashion show and obviously he shipped in all the girls from from my school to be the models and it just so happened that I was at school with uh, Jodie Kidd the she eventually became a model and um, so I had to share I was in the fashion show and I had to share this catwalk moment with Jodie Kidd oh no and uh, you know beautiful statuesque girl and they put me in these ridiculously high heels that I I think I was 14 or 15 at the time and I obviously wasn't used to wearing shoes like that and I literally all I remember is I walk onto this catwalk and you can imagine what happened next I just fall flat on my face oh no in front of all these boys and it was literally the most embarrassing moment I wanted to just die and sinking into the ground and for nobody to see me ever again but I couldn't so I literally had to stand up and put my shoes on and walk and then come back and I did it. You didn't hurt yourself. No, and no, you did no. It. it was just the embarrassment. It was absolutely mortifying. And so that was the end of my modeling career. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. So if you could imagine that you can step into a future version of yourself, what kind of advice do you think you could share with present state version of you? So this is a great question. And I often think about what I would say to myself from 20 years ago, like how I feel about myself now is very different to all the insecurities and the, you know, the silly worries that I had when I was 20 years younger. So it would probably be, it would probably be a similar sort of sentiment to just not, not give a shit about what people think, just go for it. You're very lucky. You've got a great life don't worry about it, you know, just keep going. I don't know if I would say anything more deep, just to enjoy, just to enjoy the life that we have. I'm sure in 20 years time, I'll look at my 40 year old self and wish I, you know, was back there and not 60 and full of wrinkles. And (laughs) And actually the other thing that I would probably say to myself is to just to enjoy my children. I'm going through that stage now with my children where we're, we're hitting the, the teenage years. It can be all a bit fraught. It won't be long before they will leave home and I'm sure I'll miss them terribly. So it would probably be, you know, just enjoy it, live your life and make the most of the, the time that you have with your with your kids while they're there. That's gorgeous. Thank you so much. And then my last question, what brings you happiness? So I've sort of covered this a little bit in previous in previous answers, but it is really, for me, it's being outside. Like, I think when I'm old, I'm going to get into gardening because I just, and you know, you and I both have jobs where we're at our desks for a lot of the day. And I, I just need to be outside and be in nature and go for a run or a swim in order to feel like I've had a good day and I'm terrible my kids if if it's a sunny day I just can't be inside and I can't let anyone else be inside we have to go outside if it's a sunny day so yeah that's what brings me happiness it's it's being outside being on the water being up a mountain that sort of thing pretty simple pleasures and good wine good food (laughs) yeah 
Uh, Manfreda, thank you so much for your time today, for answering all of my questions. So if people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Yes, I'm online. I have a website. It's manfredakavatsa.com. And I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn. uh, So you can connect with me on any of those channels. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. I know I will be speaking to you very soon and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Manfreda for being my guest on the show today. You can find her at manfredacavazza.com and on Instagram at freddywright78 and all of the links are in the show notes. So friends and listeners, thank you again for joining me. If you'd like to hear more, you can subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. If you'd like to get in touch with me, it's at Anvi on Twitter or Instagram and at underscore out of the clouds as well, where I also like to share guided meditations and other daily musings about mindfulness. So you can find all episodes and more on my website, anvimulatala.com. If you don't know how to spell it, that's okay. Again, the link is in the show notes. I suggest you subscribe if you'd like to receive news and my bi-monthly newsletter. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Out of the Clouds. And I hope you'll join me again next time. Until then, be well, be safe, and take care.